And first, we have a video from Spain entitled Teaching and Learning with Living Heritage, Omadero in Geography, Music and Art Classes, which, which was produced through a joint UNESCO-European Union project on education and cultural heritage. Hola, me llamo Sara, tengo 15 años y vivo en Cangas, una ciudad preciosa situada a la orilla del mar en Galicia, al noroeste de España. Cada año en febrero con mis amigos participo en el entroido de mi ciudad. Nos disfrazamos, disfrutamos y celebramos el final del invierno. Este año con nuestros profesores trabajamos en una de las figuras más expresivas, Omerdeiro. Recibimos una conferencia de la Asociación Cultural Amerdeira. Y ahora que sé más sobre esta figura, me he dado cuenta de lo mucho que tiene que decir sobre nosotros, nuestras tradiciones y nuestra historia. El personaje de Omerdeiro fue creado hace siglos por pescadores que querían vestirse con las ropas de los campesinos para burlarse de ellos. Los agricultores solían viajar a la costa para recoger algas y usarlas como abono para sus campos. Los pescadores los miraban con desprecio y usaban esta figura para expresar su desdén. Así que, en otras palabras, Omerdeiro es el resultado de la antigua rivalidad entre campesinos y pescadores. Pero sobre todo refleja lo mucho que la cultura gallega está profundamente arraigada en las tradiciones agrícolas y pesqueras. Decidimos usar Omerdeiro en la escuela para aprender sobre nuestra cultura, historia y patrimonio cultural inmaterial. Con mis profesores identificamos primero las tradiciones gallegas asociadas a él y las que aún están vivas hoy en día. Luego organizamos una clase especial para presentar a los alumnos lo que es el patrimonio intangible. Hablamos de Omerdeiro y sobre todos los aspectos asociados a nuestra cultura, como las tradiciones pesqueras, la poesía oral, la música y muchos más. A continuación, visitamos una empresa pesquera y, en particular, una asociación de mujeres artesanas de redes. Quedamos muy impresionados. La fabricación de la red requiere tanto ingenio, herramientas específicas, varias técnicas artesanales y paciencia. Nos dimos cuenta de que la fabricación de la red se ha transmitido a través de las generaciones durante siglos y que sigue siendo fundamental hoy en día para los pescadores locales. El espíritu de Omerdeiro también se puede encontrar en muchos aspectos de nuestra cultura musical. Muchas canciones se refieren a las labores agrícolas, la fertilidad del suelo y la íntima relación de los pescadores gallegos con el mar. Con nuestro profesor de música aprendimos la canción tradicional Eu son marineiro y estudiamos el ritmo de las canciones tradicionales gallegas que es muy específico. Con nuestra profesora de arte, creamos, después, máscaras inspiradas en Omerdeiro. Pasamos por todo el proceso, desde el diseño de los rostros y el corte de las formas, hasta la pintura. También usamos la máscara en clase y entendimos que este proceso pudo haber evitado disputas y tensiones entre los dos grupos en el pasado. Obviamente, todo esto no habría sido posible sin el entusiasmo de mi profesora Sabela, sus colegas y el apoyo tanto de la UNESCO como de la Comisión Europea. Asistimos a dos talleres de la UNESCO, el primero para aprender a diseñar este proyecto y llevar nuestro patrimonio vivo al aula, y el otro para compartir nuestras experiencias con los demás profesores y estudiantes de Europa. Este proyecto me hizo darme cuenta de que en cada detalle de nuestra cultura viva hay una historia. Tradiciones escondidas, técnicas valiosas, conocimientos y valores. Y nosotros, como estudiantes, deberíamos trabajar en ello con nuestros profesores y mantener este patrimonio vivo en el presente y para las generaciones futuras.
I would now like to invite Maria Gurez Khan, an education expert from Pakistan, to react to this wonderful, lively video that we've just seen. Uh, so, Maria, could you please put your video on? Um, Hello, Janet. Yeah. Hi, Maria. So, Maria, you're a project manager in culture for development and education and also a technical advisor in Pakistan. It's good to have you here today. And I would like you to share with us some of your thoughts regarding the video that we have just seen, in particular, how you think it illustrates the benefits of incorporating living heritage into education and of monitoring this. And you may wish to uh, make reference to the connection that this has with achieving and monitoring SDG 4.7. Over to you, Maria. Uh, thank you, Janet. Um, it's a pleasure to be a part of this forum today. Um, I think the video shown is a great example of how living heritage contributes to education for sustainable development. And uh, as mentioned by Hala, as students learn better when taught through their own local language and examples identified from their own contexts. Um, here, in terms of knowledge, values, and skills, we see linguistic skill development through oral history. We saw students learning about their community, its history, traditional crafts, and art practices. In environmental science, we saw that you know they're learning about their natural heritage and sustainable traditional agricultural practices. They learned, they, they learned the use of the tradition for conflict resolution. Um, students were involved in the designing of the project. They're using research skills, critical thinking skills. All types of learners were involved in the process. And it was interesting to see learning networks were established with other schools. So what we see here is that this synergy between culture and education can contribute to not just SDG 4, but to many of the other SDGs also, whether it's quality education, promoting well-being, sustainable agriculture, management of resources, uh, climate change, uh, sustainable tourism. So I mean, it covers a very broad range of uh, SDGs. Um, in response to your question on on, the monitor, on monitoring the impact of activities linked to uh, 4.7. I think one of the challenges is that both quantitative and qualitative data are required to measure the knowledge, skills, and learning outcomes for uh, sort of intangible goals of global citizenship and, and sustainable development. Um, a second challenge is that the intersectoral aspect of, of 4.7, which means it requires interdepartmental, interministerial, and interprovincial, um, uh, you know, coordination. Um, if I could give an example from Pakistan, reporting on 4.7 has not been possible due to data gaps and there's different interpretation of indicators um, and the lack of clarity on the methodology. So I think um, one way forward, in addition to capacity building, um, is to utilize, and this is also mentioned by Tim and, um, uh, and other speakers also, is to utilize maybe the data, state parties can utilize data from the reporting that's already taking place under UNESCO's overall results framework uh, of the 2003 convention to report on, on um, this uh, uh, on, on this SDG and um, these indicators. Um, yes, so thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Maria, for those very insightful comments. And it is now my pleasure to invite Fatma Mostafa, a museum specialist from Egypt, to tell us about educational activities relating to living heritage that are being done by the Children's Museum in Cairo. Uh, yeah, and all I of the video. Thank, Thank you, you, Jeanette. Yes, Thank hello. you, Jeanette. Uh, play, explore, learn. This is our method at the Children Museum of Cairo to teach children the importance and the respect of living heritage. The museum offers a package of interactive exhibition and educational program, such as tradition uh, irrigation system, astronomical uh, observation, tradition bed making. In this program, water wheel children from five to 15 years old come and enjoy playing around a big water table, explore three different kinds of irrigation tools, learn about Egyptian tradition irrigation system. Children join the program whether they come with their families, summer camps, or school trips. We have linked the exhibition to the school curricula. 
for the, uh, for the target age groups. Some of my colleagues go to school to invite the children, uh, uh, teacher with their students, sorry, with their student uh, uh, to visit the museum. This program reached more than 1 million Egyptian child till today. We hope we can serve more and more children in this regard. Thank you very much, uh, Fatma. So there you are describing the interactive exhibition that you organized about water wheel and traditional irrigation systems. Now I would be interested to hear about your educational program on knowledge related to nature and the universe and how this links with the museum exhibit that you have on this. Yes, Janet, the museum offer program on uh, knowledge related to nature and universe, such as herbal treatment and the astronomical observation program. We do this program as a part of exhibition interpretation plan. Astronomical observation program, uh, as we can see in the image, are night educational program for family. It's only for family, where children can only join uh, with their families. The museum offers these program periodically in conjunction of, uh, with the cognizance uh, of one of uh, astronomical phenomena. For this uh, program, we held a cooperation protocol with astronomy uh, institution here in Egypt, which is a governmental uh, agency, where the institution provides us with telescope specialists. We, in turn, do necessary publicity for this program, as well as conducting some workshop for children uh, related to, uh, to the phenomena. Uh, phenomena. Uh, other time, we organize uh, trips for family to an institution, uh, uh, um, astronomical uh, observation center out of Cairo uh, to see uh, other phenomena uh, live. Okay, uh, these programs are uh, among the most popular family programs the museum offer. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Fatma. There's, this is a really interesting example of how the heritage institutions that are mentioned in question 4.3, which I showed you earlier of the reporting form, can contribute towards education and living heritage. I would also like to conclude by mentioning that your museum has also developed an interactive toolkit for living heritage in Cairo. Sadly, we do not have the time to describe it here now, but I believe that many local teachers have been requesting this toolkit, which is really great news. Yes, yes. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Luis Enrique Lopez from Peru, who is a senior specialist in intercultural bilingual education. So, Luis Enrique, um, we can see some lovely images here of some of the educational programs relating to intercultural bilingual education in Bolivia. And so I'd like you to start by describing one of the pedagogical tools that we see here uh, with the socio-festive and productive calendar and explaining how it's used in education. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Janet. Uh, the socio-festive and productive calendar is a useful and culturally appropriate device that allows for diversifying the national curriculum from the pressing needs, perspectives, and queries of indigenous societies. These calendars are constructed with active community participation since the aim is to rememorate and recover the most relevant social and productive activities rural communities engage in every month. Teachers perform as facilitators and stimulate elders and community-wise people to explain in their preferred language or languages what every activity implies. Other community members get involved in the preparation of graphic representations of the selected activities for each month. With all these cultural resources at hand, the teaching staff, with the support of their pedagogical advisor, engage in curriculum planning and creatively look for complementarity between the activities selected and the competencies established by the official curriculum. From then on, teachers continue with their lesson plans, looking at the region, the nation, and the world 
with local lenses and later engage their students in culturally and meaningful situated learning through specific project-based learning activities. To my mind, such a device is useful beyond rural communities and could also be applied in urban settings to creatively, creatively find means to engage neighborhoods and schools in close cooperation. By no means does intercultural education need to be restricted to rural communities? As we say in Latin America, if the aim is quality education for all, such as ours, bilingual uh, intercultural education yeah, uh, has to be constructed into and built into the educational systems. The social festive and productive calendar opens a path towards achieving that goal, as we have seen in the pictures, that relate not only to rural areas, but also to urban areas, not only to Bolivia, but these devices being used in Peru, in Bolivia, in Guatemala, and in very many other countries. Thank you, Janet. Well, thank you very much. That is extremely interesting. And I wonder if you can explain how intercultural bilingual education can help to build mutual respect and to celebrate cultural diversity as a value. And how does this relate to the idea of quality education that's expressed in SDG 4, especially for indigenous children? Sure, sure. Uh, intercultural bilingual education, or IBE for short, is certainly a useful and effective device for linking cultural and educational goals. Since language and culture are inseparable from one another, pupils engaged in IBE also have the opportunity to become bilingual or even polyglot. Combined, all of these ingredients allow for developing new intercultural citizenship through which diversity is respected. Furthermore, Pupils who get involved in intercultural educational processes not only discover the value of diversity and individual differences, but also strengthen their self-esteem and learn more and more effectively. At the same time, they become aware that there are other knowledge, values, and social practices and constantly constrict, contrast their own with those of others and look for possible complementation. As stated, they also learn two languages and through them, they enter into new worlds and discover other perspectives and worldviews. Additionally, learning two languages prepares them to acquire a third and even a fourth one more easily. Furthermore, they become more cognitively flexible and develop critical and reflective thinking precisely because they constantly move between two languages, two cultural horizons, and two worlds to find new strategies to solve the problems they encounter in everyday life. Having said that, frankly, I do not see a more effective and per pertinent way to comply with the goals of SDG 4 in indigenous societies than through intercultural bilingual education. Besides, as the implementation of IBE requires active community participation and also encourages girls and boys alike to continue and complete their formal schooling, this type of education contributes to the achievement of other goals and, others, and other SDGs such as those linked to gender equality and the consolidation of democracy, for example. Last but not least, <clears throat> sorry, and to be consistent with my previous comment, at least in Latin America, intercultural bilingual education should no, should no longer be seen as a type of education only for a sector of the population. In an increasingly intercultural world, world like ours, it should be offered to everyone. We all need to open our minds and hearts, leave aside ethnocentrisms, manage and value diversity, and ultimately 
learn to live together. Thank you, Janet. Well, thank you very much indeed, Luis Enrique.